Hey, SRT Peebler again. Welcome back, Mitochondriac. Today, we're going to take a detour into the pentose phosphate pathway, and this is going to be critically important to understand when it comes to cancer and metabolic therapies. So the pentose phosphate pathway is a glucose burning pathway that runs in parallel to glycolysis to produce ribose 5 phosphate, which is a backbone of DNA and RNA, and nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate Ribose 5-phosphate is useful for nucleotide synthesis, while NADPH is involved in redox homeostasis, as well as in the promotion of biosynthetic processes such as synthesis of tetrahydrofolate, deoxyribonucleotides, proline, fatty acids, and cholesterol. Through NADPH, the PPP plays a critical role in suppressing oxidative stress, including in certain cancers, in which PPP inhibition may be therapeutically useful. Conversely, PPP-derived NADPH also supports purposeful cellular generation of, of reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, RNS, for signaling and pathogen killing. Genetic deficiencies in PPP occur relatively common in the committed pathway enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, G6PD. G6PD deficiency typically manifests as hemolytic anemia, where essentially red blood cells break themselves down due to damage, due to red cell oxidative stress, but in severe cases also result in infections due to lack of leukocyte oxidative burst, highlighting the dual redox roles of the pathway in free radical production and detoxification. The review discusses the PPP in mammals, covering its role in biochemistry, physiology, and disease. So... We need to take a step back here, and we're going to look quickly at glycolysis. So or if you remember right, glycolysis takes glucose from outside the cell, inside the cell, converts it to glucose 6-phosphate, and then glucose 6-phosphate is then converted all the way down to pyruvate, which then in normal cells would get converted to acetyl-CoA, be put into the Krebs cycle, and subsequently the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. In cancer cells, however, remember, remember that pyruvate is getting primarily converted to lactate, which, which sets up the acidic tumor microenvironment. However, there's an offshoot pathway called the PPP or the pentose phosphate pathway. And as you can see here, glucose 6-phosphate is also, in addition to going down towards pyruvate through glycolysis, is getting moved to the right into another series of biochemical reactions. And these biochemical reactions are important for generating this chemical right here, NADPH, the reduced form of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, which is important for the recycling of glutathione to maintain redox homeostasis and the building of ribose 5-phosphate, which is the backbone of all of the DNA that's replicated for cancer growth and, and cell replication. So as we're going to learn, in when we start talking more about therapies, we're going to talk about how we're going to shut this process down, okay? And by shutting this process down, both glycolysis and subsequently the PPP, we're going to leave the cancer cell exceedingly vulnerable to oxidative stress because it's no longer going to have this NADPH, which is no longer going to be able to recycle glutathione. And glutathione is a very powerful antioxidant. So learning about the PPP is critically important. So in this paper, it says the energy metabolism is significantly reprogrammed in many human cancers, and these alterations confer many advantages to cancer cells, including the promotion of biosynthesis, ATP generation, detoxification, and support of rapid growth. The pentose phosphate pathway is a major pathway for glucose catabolism or breakdown. The PPP directs glucose flux to its oxidative branches and produces a reduced form of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, NADPH, an essential reductant in anabolic processes, so it helps with building biomolecules, it has become clear that the PPP plays a critical role in regulating cancer cell growth by supporting cells with not only ribose 5-phosphate, but also NADPH for detoxification of intracellular reactive oxygen species, reductive biosynthesis, and ribose biosynthesis. The alteration of the PPP contributes to directly to cell proliferation, survival, and senescence. Furthermore, further studies have shown that the PPP is regulated oncologically and or metabolically by numerous factors, including tumor suppressors, oncoproteins, and and intracellular metabolites. This regulation of PPP flux dramatically impacts cancer growth and survival. Therefore, a better understanding of how the PPP is reprogrammed and the mechanisms underlying the balance between glycolysis and PPP flux in cancer will be valuable in developing therapeutic strategies targeting the pathway. I agree fully. This is important. So 
this is kind of a 20,000 foot view of how the PPP is used in cancer cells. So let's start at the top, elevated cell proliferation. Because of glycolysis, you're able to have ATP production. And then because of the PPP, we're able to have increased DNA synthesis, lipid synthesis or fat synthesis. And it also drives the cell cycle progression. It's going to help us avoid programmed cell death because it's going to help with DNA repair and it's going to decrease oxidative stress and ROS. And if you saw in that one paper, it said RNS, which stands for reactive nitrogen species. We'll talk about that in depth when we get deeper into the, the redox portion of this series. But needless to say, it's a very protective mechanism for the cells. And if we are able to cut this off, we reduce their ability to protect themselves and put them at a high vulnerability to oxidative therapies. It's also responsible for hastened angiogenesis by increasing VEGF, which stands for vascular endothelial growth factor and nitric oxide synthesis. And kind of already alluded to, it's important for DNA synthesis, ATP production, lipid synthesis, angiogenesis, and then exaggerated invasiveness by decreasing ROS, decreasing oxidative stress, increasing ATP production and angiogenesis. It's also important for resistance to drug therapy by similar mechanisms, as well as drug efflux or taking drugs outside the cell and metabolizing those drugs so that they can't be effective. So this is going to, for the most part, wrap up the metabolic pathways that are happening outside the mitochondria. We talked in detail about the glycolysis pathway, the Warburg effect, the reverse Warburg effect, and now the pentose phosphate pathway. The next step for our journey as mitochondriacs and for those interested in cancer in particular is that we're going to dive into the basics of mitochondria. And then we're going to dive into very deep aspects of mitochondrial physiology, especially the electron transport chain and what goes on on the inner mitochondrial membrane and the inner membrane space in order to produce the ATP necessary to provide our cells with the bioenergetics necessary to maintain our health. So if you like these videos, please like, subscribe, share with friends and family who may need this information. Because although right now we've been dealing with a lot of what I would call necessary groundwork to understand how mitochondrial metabolic therapies actually work, why they work, and why they're important so that you get buy-in from either your doctor or yourself or anybody who is struggling with cancer, because if they don't understand what they're doing and why it's important, then it's going to make it a lot harder. Because unlike conventional therapies, the metabolic therapies that Dr. Seafried talks about takes a lot more effort. I mean, being on a ketogenic diet, a therapeutic ketogenic diet is not easy. You know, intermittent fasting for one to five days is not easy. So in summary, although these therapies that we're going to be addressing in gruesome detail in the near future are really marvels of modern medical science understanding of tumor metabolism. They will require a lot more out of the individual who is seeking this type of treatment. It's going to require a lot more curiosity and more of a co-management between whoever is putting you on these therapies and the person receiving the therapies. It's going to require a much more active role in the process, which obviously in some ways will be more difficult practically, but at the same time, having the ability to participate in your own healing has got to be also very rewarding. And I hope hope that whoever is interested in these kind of therapies can see that ultimate benefit. Until next time.